Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the PC Perspective Podcast. We're already at episode 755. It's January 10, 2024. As we record this, I am Sebastian Peak. I am Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. I'm probably not an AI bot. Brett Van Spruberg. I don't know. They don't seem to have figured sure, out your background yet, which is suggestive mm -hmm. of a, some sort it of a generative AI, which may, this may be the that, last no. time you hear us use those words on this podcast, yes, by the way. It, hopefully. It should be. Those are forbidden. Mm -hmm. Forbidden words as we mm -hmm. discuss CES 2024 in full swing. And uh, before we talk about CES, we got to thank our patrons who make all this possible, keeping the lights on. James P. gets a special shout out this week. Thank you very much, James. He does. He's a ghast. He he knows. Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, you know, isn't yes. that a monster? Yes. A ghast? It is. It is. It's also mm -hmm. the reaction you see I don't when know. you breathe near one. Mm -hmm. James uh -huh. might be a ghast. I don't I don't know. He All right. Uh, he knows. Our most important segment leading up to news has to be Josh's food segment. Please take it away. It's it's you know, it's it's it was the special was the hatch green chili burger again, but I didn't feel like it. I, I just wanted and I've been craving one for a while, just just a regular cheeseburger. And so that's what I got. Got a regular cheeseburger. It was two patties. I think they smashed them. They sure seemed it. Cheddar, lettuce, tomato, pickles and onions. You know, full leaf lettuce, not not the shredded crap. And then I, I, I did a little extra. I, I put chipotle mayo on there. And it was a refreshing change in terms of what you could want in a burger. I mean, usually we have all these really fancy, interesting, crazy specials. But, you know, sometimes you just need a cheeseburger. And so I got one and it was, it was great. It was everything I wanted. So, yeah, even their cheeseburgers, plain cheeseburgers, are good. Who'd have thought? Let's get into CES 2024. And, hey, I know it's a new year. A lot of things happened last year. A lot of, you know, not so exciting things for the DIY PC enthusiast community as far as pricing of graphics cards, uh, you know, value for money. But it's a new year, and AMD, there was this long-rumored, you know, new Radeon card coming. And they announced it, and we got details. They showed a slide with specs. It is the first disappointing graphics card of 2024. <laughs> yes. The RX 7600 XT featuring 16 gigabytes of memory, and pretty much that's the selling point because it has the same exact GPU core as the 7600. They've bumped up the clocks a little bit. The game clock goes up by almost 10%, so that's something. The boost yeah. clock only goes up about 4%. Memory speed's exactly the same. It's still just a 128-bit bus for that 16 gigabytes of memory. And to implement double the memory and an up to 10% overclock, they had to add a second 8-pin power connector. Whoa. So you've yeah. got dual 8-pins. That's 2080 Ti territory. It's only 190 watt TDP though. We'll see what it actually draws. But I mean, for two eight pins for something with 32 compute units seems yeah. a little excessive. I'm wondering if they're not uh, giving their partners a little bit of overhead for uh, being a bit more aggressive with uh, their clocks than just what the standard. You know, they're they're. they're I didn't think they're supposed to have a uh, a reference design. And certainly they're not passing any out to reviewers. So, you know, I'm no. kind of confused about, about there that There is one. no reference design, according to AMD. Yeah. So I'm, I'm thinking we're going to see some uh, variability uh, from the partners uh, because, um, you know, we received one for review and I don't know when any of that unboxing stuff can be done. Um but uh, we do know that it's going to be released on the 24th, I believe. Yes. And uh, the partners include Acer, ASRock, Asus, Gigabyte, PowerColor, Sapphire, of course, and XFX. And the pricing. Huzzah. The pricing. Okay. If you were okay with the price of the RX 7600, no, some people were not. It's a $269 base price card. 
the 7600 XT is $60 more at 329. So for $60, you get double the RAM and an up to 10% overclock out of the box. Which, I mean, when you look at partner cards, even a factory overclock usually costs you 20, 30, 40 extra dollars. So you're getting double the RAM and an overclock. It seems okay to me, except this is like a $199 card. What's that? What else could you buy for $330? Right, right. And that that's yeah. the point I raised at the end of this post where I got into this whole problem of the RX 6000 series still being out there and still available yep. brand new at places like Newegg. You can buy a 6700 XT with way more memory bandwidth. Yes, it only has 12 gigabytes, but for this level of GPU power, I think 12 is enough. If you're just doing 1440 gaming, it's less money to buy a 6700 XT brand new than it is to buy the 7600 XT. Uh, yeah. So that's how probably going to be the more interesting, uh, um, the, the two things I'm most interested in is how it compares to the 6700 XT, 6700 XT, as well as the RK 770. Yeah. Um, I I wonder if if you know I, it wouldn't shock me if with this overclock and things partners do that it would be around the same performance of a 6700 XT, but it, it should be quite a bit faster than the A770 that. Is a little below the price range, but it's 16 gigs. Um, yeah, and you can get an A770 for about 279 to 299, mm-hmm. depending. Um, so yeah, those are those are going to be interesting, interesting comparisons. Um, I could see why they they did this. There was kind of a gap, obviously, in between the 7600 and the 7700 XT. I mean, there are rumors of a vanilla 7700 coming out, but. We haven't seen anything official about that. Um, when I originally got this card in, I thought it was a cut down Navi 32, which powers the 7700 XT and the 7800 XT. I thought that they, you know, cut it down to 128 bit, uh, only two, you know, the memory modules of the four active and, and uh, probably, you know, a few cut down, obviously, on the, on the, on the shaded cores or streaming cores or whatever the hell they want to call it, compute cores. Um, but it's not the case. I was kind of surprised. So yeah, this is kind of a, a supercharged, uh, Navi 33, mm-hmm. I believe is the, is the code. So yeah, it's going to be interesting to see. And, uh, you know, we do, we do have games out there that utilize more than eight gigs of memory. Yes. Uh, so to having 16, will at least take that bottleneck out. It, you know, it's going to be a 1080p for the most part, card, uh, older titles. <laughs> if it's that can a 1080p, if it's um, a 1080p level need... GPU, then who the heck cares about 16 gigabytes of memory? Yeah, yeah. why do you need Well, I mean, if you're, gig... you're running Hogwarts at, at full thing at 1080, right? It'll okay. run it perfectly fine. It's your 1080 it's Ultra card, except it's not really to fast 14. enough to do 1080 Ultra in the latest it's, titles. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I was just looking at Newegg, and I swear when I did the news post on the 7600 XT, at least one of these 6700 XTs on uh, Newegg was 319. The price has gone up. So now your entry level. Yeah. RX 6700 XT is now start at 329.99. So it's the same price for a 6700 XT and a 7600 XT. I still, I would still buy the 6700 XT. Personally, but I won't know for a fact till I look at Josh's review. I want to see yes. how the actual performance is. Maybe that faster clock is going to give us a lot more than than I think. Yeah, I'm often wrong. I don't know. But hey, well, Nvidia. That's why, we, that's why we test these things. Exactly. Yeah. And by yeah. the way, Nvidia also they had teased a new graphics card at CES or a series of them. It's the RX 40 series super cards and Super. we knew these were coming supper so, but it's kind of interesting first of all don't call it a price drop it's not a price drop they have simply adjusted the lineup which yeah. also includes adjustments in prices you may notice here in this chart this graphic there are some missing cards they have apparently eol'd the 4080 they're just going to have the 4080 super and it's going to be 200 dollars less so instead of eleven ninety nine, you have nine ninety nine for a card that will be presumably faster because it says super at the end of it. 
Well, that didn't upset everyone the last time they did it, did it? No, not at all. Or or no. or is the forty seventy Ti super just too close to you know forty eighty? I was hoping against hope that this was not going to be. They have the added Ti super Ti yeah. and super to the end of a forty seventy. Why? Well, it why? gets better when a partner card gets it. They're going to add their thing to the end of that. Ooh, so yeah. Like the forty seventy Ti great. super. Uh, BTG Supreme, yeah. the, yes, Super hey, Supreme, Supreme. Aces, Aces, I, I, I yes, I can't Ace, wait for the XFX version. Oh, it's, yeah, wait. Aces yeah. already <laughs> announced a forty seventy Ti Super BTF, so it just keeps on going. <laughs> but uh, back to this chart because the forty seventy Ti Super exists now at seven ninety nine. That was the original price of the forty seventy Ti. The forty seventy Super takes the place of the 4070 but it's not being retired for some reason they give it a meager $50 discount and leave yeah. it in the lineup but guess what's missing the 4060 Ti 16 gig gone ooh interesting hmm. well, that's so not then super. they have this gap at, from 399 with the 4060 Ti hmm. unless they're just giving everybody the 16 gig version for 399 now I don't I yeah. doesn't say yeah, I see the maybe. 16 gig 4060 Ti was around 450, so yeah, there's their yeah. hole right there. They yeah, really the hole should be filled by the 4070. Just make it 499 and put it there. Yeah, yeah. But you know, money. Is that going to be a system stuff. builder card? And it's just we don't care if you buy it. Okay, I I did see an RTX 4070 today. I think on special for it was 529. So it was less than the you know MSRP that that Nvidia is putting out. So I think that we're going to see them. Closer to 500 once everything's said and done, because right now 7800 XT is still kind of ruling the roost at, at that. Uh, but it's going to have some some serious competition with the uh, 4070 Super, which replaces the old 4070 Ti and is slightly slower, I believe, but not by much. Yeah, via Andreas Schilling on Twitter, he had posted these uh, specifications for each card, because of course NVIDIA was not heavy on specs during the announcement. Is everybody okay? No. Nope. So yeah. the 4070 Super Founders Edition specifications. You have 7,168 CUDA cores, base clock 1980, boost clock 2475, memory clock is 10,500. What is the effect? Oh, 21 gigabit per second effective. <clears throat> 120 new bit memory interface. Yeah, 192-bit interface, 504 gigabytes per second. So 20% more CUDA cores than the original. Yeah, that's going to have an impact <clears throat> on it. I think the 4070 Super. Ti Super is is going to be the first one to really start selling out. Yeah. Um, you know, the 799 price point isn't great. However, this is like their first card that really gives, you know, someone who owns like a 3060 Ti or a 3070 Ti or my case a 3080 you actually it, it's actually an upgrade for about the same price as i paid for mm. the rtx 3080 back in the days and if you you know factor in inflation uh it's actually less than what i paid for the 3080 back in the day um yeah yeah it's i think that one's going to be kind of popular i mean the 4080 super for a thousand bucks that's still a stretch i mean it's going to be faster i think than the 4080 the regular one um should be and uh it's it's going to suffer a little bit in raster performance against the 7900 xtx that is approximately that same price if not a little bit lower uh but of course you're you're talking about dlss3 and frame generation and yes yes uh, their yes. rtx you know the rt cores are, are better and faster and yeah, well, sure, because they're doing it with hardware and not software. Um, Corsair <laughs> has a page dedicated to the difference between the 4070 Ti Super and the 4070 Ti. This is exactly what I wanted. Thanks, Corsair. Looking for a great cost-performance ratio and are wondering if the latest NVIDIA RTX 4070 Ti Super could be the answer? So they have a spec comparison. The 4070 Ti Super has 8,448 CUDA cores. The original Ti only had 7,680. The frequencies are the same. Memory capacity increases. Uh, the 4070 Ti Super is 16 gigs. Finally. 
Oh, and and interface and bandwidth too. Yeah, look at that. that 256. Bandwidth, that's a nice, that's a yeah, nice boost. That's gonna here's, have an impact. Here's the deal. It's a 4080 because this is based on AD103, so it's a slightly yep. cut down 4080. Mm-hmm. Shocking. Yeah. Shocking. That's obvious the reason why they had to remove the 4080 from the lineup. There you go. Uh, yeah. Yeah. They, they haven't removed the 4080. This, well, this is the 4080. Is that your point? Yes, yeah. yeah, that's exactly my so point. So wait a minute. Exactly. Hold on. Hold on. Let me get this. Let me get this right. This could actually be something exciting for PC gaming in 2024. Yeah. Just yeah. a few short days ago, the RTX 4080 existed at 1199 US dollars, twelve hundred dollars, and now that Where are you approximately going? the Where same you? performance level is seven ninety nine can be yours it's, for seven ninety nine. It's actually like ten percent slower the the forty seventy Ti Super. Come on, but can't we just still. call it a forty? Okay, so it's a slightly but, but, slower you know forty eighty. Four hundred bucks. Four. Am I doing the math right? Yeah, four hundred bucks. Less. That's and you're getting. Damn near close to that performance. So this is exciting for yeah. consumers for a change. Yeah, eight, spending eight hundred dollars is always exciting, Josh. No, it is not nowadays, exciting. Sebastian. I guess I hate to say it, but can we talk about things that are cheaper than eight eight hundred dollars? Let's go back to AMD. AMD had more to say than just the 7600 XT, thankfully. And they talked about new processors. They are piling it on. They're just giving you more and more reasons to go with AMD with your next build because AM5 and AM4 got love at CES. The new 8000G series Mm -hmm. processors for AM5. These are entry gaming and productivity systems is what they say. I mean, you're getting RDNA 3 graphics, right? Isn't that what the 780M is? Yeah, we talked about the 8600G last week. Okay, yeah. So, right, that was rumored. Yeah, so now we have an 8700G, there's an 8600G, 85, and 8300G. And at the top, that 8700G, 8-core, 16 threads, boost up to 5.1 gigahertz, 65-watt TDP. Yeah, not Those bad, RDNA yeah. 3 graphics. This this could be very interesting. I wonder how much it will cost. Let's see if they have a chart there. 329 Yeah. For hmm. that one. Hmm. So... Yeah. Uh, I don't when know, you the see what's in that, higher, G, but it might be more cost e- efficient here at 220. Oh, God, yeah. I look at these and I just think this is all about the TDP and the fact there's integrated graphics, obviously. But it, when you're hitting yes. just 65 watts, it makes it a lot easier to integrate into a, a very compact small form factor system or maybe even a fanless system. Ooh, interesting. You, you put this APU under one of those huge Noctua fanless heat sinks and it's taking care of all the cooling. Mm. Okay, look a little bit farther down. They have introduced a new X3D part for AM4. What? <laughs> it has the same core count as the 5800 X3D, the greatest processor of all time. All time. <laughs> it's just a little slower. So it's uh, up to 4.1 gigahertz max boost. And the base clock's only 3 gigahertz. So it's significantly slower, though I wonder if maybe there's some overclocking headroom here because it only has 105-watt TDP. Maybe bump that up to like 110, 115. What, what do you think you could do with a little bit of sub-ambient? A little bit of sub-ambient cooling on this. A Pelletier or something like that. But yeah, Razor in the chat. Seems like they're clearing out lower bend parts. Yes. Mm, but you. You are, they are passing the savings on to you because yes. this at, <laughs> at launch... It's just two hundred forty nine dollars. Wow! So that's fifty dollars less than even the low three hundred dollar price we saw the fifty eight hundred X three D selling for in recent months. And typically, it's closer to like three twenty nine, I think, for that part. But now you can get your hands on the full ninety six megabytes of L three cache, hundred megabytes total, for just two forty nine. Eight cores, sixteen threads. I'm all about mm-hmm. this. And it's AM4, so that means cheaper DDR4 memory, much cheaper motherboards. Josh loves the availability of AM4 motherboards these days. Mm-hmm. Well, so you got B550, mm-hmm. B550. There's a lot of B550. <laughs> There's <laughs> lots. There's not really any lots X570 of anymore. That's no. kind of retired, I think, at this point. Sort of. <clears throat> Who's making new AM4, uh, AM4 X570? MSI has one, and, and it's actually my, my pick. 
Oh, okay. Ooh, we'll have giving, to wait for that. Giving it away. Yeah. Before we started the show, we were talking about Back to the Future. And no, I don't mean Marty and, McFly and, you know, uh, Christopher Lloyd and the DeLorean. I mean Asus. Asus? However you choose to pronounce that. Going Asus. Back to the Future with their hidden connector design. We saw something Ooh. about this at Computex, but they're they're going all in on this. They're giving you Maximus hero level motherboard options. They're giving you graphics all the way up to a 4090. 90. Wow. Not Look super. This, a, Ooh. a 4090 at, with no connector what, to melt. What? What is that little connector? What is that? Look at this. That right there, Brett, that's 450 to 600 watts. That's what that yeah. is. Do you, th- it, it do you will think that gets hot? Though. Think nah. that gets hot? Nah, no. <laughs> Look at how thick those are, though. Oh yeah, those, yeah, those, those, right leads, about that. those leads are are thick. Yeah. Hefty. yeah. Let's look at the the motherboard. Here's the Hero BTF motherboard, and uh, sada sada sada. You've got a ATX. twelve. It might be hard to make out. There's a twelve volt high power on the back of the motherboard. Yeah. Oh boy, right that's next to those sada connectors. Though. Yeah. Uh, interesting. Is that your USB C okay. underneath the? Uh, yeah. Uh, it yeah. looks like it. Here's your ATX24 well pin. Okay. Uh, USB yep. 3.0, USB C. Yep. For yeah. And four sides. Just high, high power. power. Okay, sure. No or extra USB cooling 3. on the back, eh? Huh. Um, hmm. Interesting. Yeah. I want to know what case actually will support. Ah. This kind of I'm, cable, Josh. I'm glad don't you, you asked. Just you just wait. A, a taller, a taller standoff might suffice, just to give you that enough room behind the motherboard in certain hey, cases. Pass me some of them three-inch standoffs. Yeah, two and a, two and a half. Let's not okay. enter the hyperbole <laughs> zone. <laughs> Let me see. You just I thought them all that together they're... until they're tall enough, right? Let's I just convert all of your cabling case. to right angles, and then the taller standoff. So Jeremy was telling us before the show. Sorry, Asus cases, right? Yeah, Yeah, it is. They have their own case that has extra clearance in the back. So I was asking, do you have to use right angle cables and stuff? He said, no, it's not necessary because there's enough clearance. You don't have to. Well, I mean, if you're going to try to implement one of these in a case that is not from ROG, Hmm. yeah, we'll have to see. I'm not sure exactly how that will uh, pan out. How much clearance do you? I mean, how? Here's the thing: twelve volt high power. It's going to be on the back of this motherboard. You're going to need a significant amount of clearance or a right angle connector, or you're going to have the mm-hmm. same problems on the back of your motherboard that people are having at the top edge of their graphics card. So, oh, so the smoke can come out on the back side too. If they don't yeah. want a recall, and it's less noticeable. This, <laughs> they don't want a recall on this. They're going to have to be very specific about how yes. these 12 volt high power cables are connected. Uh, I would include one with the with the board. Include uh, a oh right angle has- one. Has included the exact standoffs I was thinking of. Oh boy! In the uh, <laughs> yeah, in the PC per public uh, Discord chat. Okay, that's that's perfect. Yep, right there. That's it. Right I remember there. Remember those days. Yep, that'll do it. Yep. Okay, so there's two chassis options right now for your BTF build for out of the box compatibility. Now you could obviously mod your own case or find one with a huge rear chamber, but they have the ROG Hyperion GR701 BTF Edition. With all these specs here that I'm scrolling past, and the Tough Gaming GT302 ARGB dazzling white mid tower chassis, ready for your BTF motherboard. So they're already thinking ahead. Hey, we need to give these people extra clearance in the back for their extra cables and probably the the cutouts, the routing openings are yeah. all right where they need yeah. to be. But in so, theory, that'll do both the advanced BTF and the BTF. Now. Don't quote me on this, but I think initially these are only going to be sold in kits. I don't know if anybody's. You mean motherboard that. case together? Is that what you're saying? Yes. Motherboard yeah. case video card. Possibly. Interesting. Oh, for the oh. It's a, it, yeah, because if you're using the advanced BTF, and, you need your the advanced choice. BTF video card. Those I think and will be choice. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. You pick your GPU but, level maybe when you order. Yeah, you something. have to pick your GPU level. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Remember when Go Intel tried to release BTX? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Can, There's a yeah. lot of Dell systems out there with BTX layout. I remember. Yeah. Yeah. 
That didn't but go it was, very well. It was thermal, you well, know, it was all in line for yeah. like, you could put one cheap fan in a system and it would just cool everything. But we did generally adopt the PSU at the bottom. Yeah. 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 Nothing else but that. Yeah. Hey, speaking of Intel, MSI Claw handheld PC game console that looks like a, you know, a Steam Deck type the thing. Claw. The claw. The claw. So the Claw game console, as being reported in a non-tech here, equipped with a 7-inch touch-enabled IPS LCD display. It's full 1080p, so it's nine, mm-hmm. 1920 by 1080, 120 hertz. Yep. 500 nits. I'm worried about battery life. Two hours. Uh, a good two hours. They oh, sl- okay. They slapped in a 53-watt-hour battery, which it's, is, you know, monstrous. Yeah, this. that is big. I'm worried. I'm more worried about finger smears on a dedicated handheld for gaming. So I mean, what are they accept- using? Do you acceptable think? on my phone, but not on a gaming. The, the very first uh, Intel Ultra we've seen. Yes. Yeah, so this is Intel Ooh. powered. Intel Ultra 155H. It's a Meteor Lake system on a chip. Six high performance cores, eight E cores, cores two and then low two power LPs. cores. We wrote cones here, but I'm pretty sure he means co- yeah. cores. Built in Arc graphics with eight XZ tiles. That's 1,024 yeah. stream processors. So that so, means it supports Intel Access? I, w- I certainly hope so. Yeah. It does. Yeah, it's all Arc, man. Yeah. It's got hmm. the full software suite behind it. So, um, you know, if, if it's taken Intel a, a while to obviously realize this, but if they were to actually, you know, dedicate all of their graphics technology in a focused group, it would actually increase the overall uh, feature. And uh, uh, what would you say? Um, not affordability, but words don't fail me down. Je ne sais quoi. You Something like that. The integrated what? nature will bring cost savings. <laughs> Joie de vie. It makes it a more valuable product. Yeah. So, you know what it is. Yeah. It, 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 it's going to be faster products. You're, you're going to, you're going to you know, share the same software stack as the standalone graphics cards. Um, all of the things that AMD has been doing for ages, uh, now Intel has finally gotten it all together. And instead of having 12 different design groups doing different integrated cores and the software, people are pulling their hair out because they've got to support it all because some of their designs support a few things and this extra shader type level. And then the other ones don't, even though the other one's newer than the last. It's just it was a nightmare. And so, you know, Raja got in there. They pulled it all together and they made that into a, a single cognizant kind of group um that you know they're working together and and it's just you know a scalable architecture that they could do from integrated graphics to a you know like a scene like deck like this and have decent performance and Mm -hmm. you just have better drivers and software that continually get updated on a damn near monthly basis Mm. Plus, it's harnessing the power of Windows 11. I'm assuming exactly. Windows. Of it's Windows based. Yeah. Get excited about a handheld Windows based device. Speed, speed, speed. That's all I can think of. So much speed. X86, FTW. MSI has uh, something you should know about, which is hmm. Project Zero. They Here had it is. like one picture. If you scroll down, this is literally all they had, really. They didn't even give good pictures of the motherboards. Wait, but so you're saying that. If you don't want cable mess, you can make use of an MSI Project Zero system. I don't know, though. This Look at this unsightly power cable coming Except out of the graphics card. they don't <clears throat> have that. Good. They don't do the advanced Lord. BTF size, side, so you're okay. still going to have that 12-volt high power sticking out. But other than Hold that... Hold on. Is this the Wi-Fi antenna inside the case? I'm sure thinking looks of sure propping is. up the graphics card. But it could well, well be the too. Wi-Fi antenna. Uh, I don't is know. It? it looks like a Wi-Fi it antenna. Looks like it looks like no, a cable a coming antenna. off of it. I take it off. Yep. That's well, well, it maybe it's dual it's purpose. RGB. It's Wi-Fi antenna it's RGB. slash RGB light stick slash GPU holder. I mean, two results here. One, no one is that clever, or you've just given them an idea. This is brilliant. Put charge. some blue tack here and just kind of stick the corner <laughs> of your graphics yes. card. 
Uh, make it UV reactive so that it glows in how's, the lights. How, how's the uh, how's the antenna's performance inside a case? Amazing. What's... The glass has no effect whatsoever. <laughs> it's transparent, exactly. Josh. See, Actually, yeah, in this photo, there's no R glass F. panel. No, there's no gla look, you can F. see the clips. They took the glass panel uh, off the side yes. for this photo. You know, it They're probably getting uh, reflections better. they didn't like. They didn't have probably. a um, Been there. They didn't have Been a filter there. on the lens. So they couldn't filter out yeah. the uh, reflections. Yeah. So that's why you want a circular polarizer in your arsenal when you're taking you photos a, of yeah, that absolutely. Type of oh. you know, just twist the polarizer. Mm -hmm. and then you can oh, look. All the reflections are gone. And it looks like transparent oh, glass again. Incredible. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Filters. you've got three cases and three boards to choose from. And all Intel, of course, be for reasons unknown. Hey, look, and, it's the claw again. Speaking of Intel, yeah. look, it's the claw. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and other than okay. that, they just had a bunch of laptops and uh, some assembled in America desktops. Oh, nice. By what? the way, is this yeah. is this uh, trackpad RGB? You called it. But I wow, think they just what? sort of uh, made it look that way. I don't know, because trackpads for a while, they've been using glass, basically just phone touchscreens. Why could not be. put a screen behind it for more RGB lighting effects? That's brilliant. I pay at least 200 extra dollars for my laptop. Oh, you'll pay more than that. That's yeah. a Titan 18 inch HX. Okay. So it's an 18 inch with 4K, 120 hertz mini LED display. With a 4090 stuck in there. Oh, okay. An i9-14900HX, which okay. can hit up to 5.8 gigahertz. Did they discuss pricing supposedly. at all? No. If you have to ask. Okay. Well, yeah, that's the, that's the story with CES. It's too early for these yeah. products to be released, so they never have any idea about availability or pricing. Yeah. The Raider and Stealth are probably a little bit better, but yeah, the one that's got 128 gigs of RAM and three M.2 slots. Yeah, that one could cost you a little bit. Continue our virtual booth tour here. Let's stop by Be Quiet uh, via Tech Power Up because we were not there. But really what they had to show was white cases. You're into those cases, but you're like, yeah, I don't know about this you know, stealthy black aesthetic. What about white with RGB galore? I never yes. would have imagined yes. this look from Be Quiet just a few from years Be ago. Quiet. It's not very quiet. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, it's kind of loud. loud. Yeah. But if you're into that, this one's a little bit more subtle. I don't, I, like, do. I don't think I like the huge RGB light strips, but you know you can always turn those off. I do but like yes. the juxtaposition of the white case with the dark power series. I think that um, it's a nice naming. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, new white fans mm -hmm. go with those cases because you want everything oh, to match. Yep. So it's yes, it's kind do. of the the black tower wine of yeah. PC cases. Ah, uh, it's the yes. white wine in the black bottle in the uh, in yep. unseeable. In Sticking with tech power up here, Micron is the first to market with LPDDR5X-based LPCAM2 memory. Sorry if we're throwing too many acronyms at you. You know LPCAM, that disruptive technology that shrinks down the size of memory to what looks kind of like a M.2 SSD with some extra power delivery connected to the side of it? It's significantly smaller and allows for slimmer 64% space savings, by the way, from this whoa, package whoa, versus whoa. a DIMM. Where, well, versus where would you two put the RGB? Where would you put the RGB no, no, lighting no, on no, this? No, 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 RGB. no RGB. No, no, no RGB yet. Mm, this is for laptops. Okay. This is the for some business machine that's even slimmer Ooh. now that they can get away with. Yeah. It. Mm -hmm. Paper thin. Wafer oh, thin good. laptops so we'll coming Dump soon. everything but USB-C and mini display port because even HDMI is too thick to fit on them. Oh, HDMI has long been too thick for those <laughs> svelte laptops. Uh, so we, yeah, we need a mini USB-C. That's, that's what's next. It'll be, uh, it'll look <laughs> like USB a SIM Sorry. card, like a Sorry. nano SIM was, with a wire. Was I laughing out loud? Oh, you, you didn't go with a mini SD card? Because that was what I was Oh, that would be better. Yeah. <laughs> mini SD card with two oh. pieces of hair coming off of it. <laughs> yeah, coming right. soon. It's like smaller than the antenna connector. You know what I'm saying? Yes. Like the yeah. internal antenna, like the ones that you pop down, smaller those are, than that. Those are chunky. Smaller than that. You want to get rid of those. In fact, they're going to have to come up with a new type of those because they're too chunky now. They are. They're way, way too big. Four or five millimeters. Yeah. Whew, huge. <laughs> okay. Uh, I don't know why I didn't have this further up on the list. We were talking about Asus at CES earlier. One of the most interesting, I guess, 
announcements was their 4060 Ti Dual, Dual being the entry level for Asus graphics cards typically, but this one has a trick up its sleeve, hiding behind the uh, back plate. Mm-hmm. Essentially, is door an M.2 slot. Their thinking is, look, it's a, it's a by eight card with a 16 pin connector. Let's make the use of those extra lanes. Yeah. Put your SSD on there. Well, I mean, you're running a motherboard where either you're out of M.2 slots or if you enable that second one, your PCI slot's going to drop to eight by anyways. Why not just skip it? Slap it right on there. And uh, it's now got a direct or at least a more direct route to the CPU. It yeah, that's true. It's, that's it's true. on the bolt-on one. It, yeah. I was thinking that this would be a great solution for a micro uh, mini ITX where you only have mm-hmm. one PCIe. Mm-hmm. And maybe uh-huh. you want to add more M.2 drives than your motherboard supports. Well, now you get this dual, which is probably smaller case-friendly anyway, gives you an yeah. extra slot. Now, what I don't understand is how this whole bifurcation of different PCIe standards works because it's, it's PCIe 5 compatible, but the card itself is only... 4.0. So I, yeah, but you're plugging it into a five with bifurcation, and the, okay. the SSD will run at PCI 5.0, passively cooled because well, it's attached to a very large cooler, of course. You'd think, yeah, bigger, bigger even than the one uh, we showed last week. So yeah, it just essentially you've got two uh, eight lanes are not talking to the other eight lanes, and away yes, you go. So the bifurcation lanes are just the, split. It's bifurcation signaling. Yeah, yeah, the signaling can yeah. be different. Yes pretty nifty and no one's that i know of that i can think of has been taking advantage of this but i also can't think what they would do with it well, now you can this yes. is yeah at first look this is use. weird but no this makes sense and it's actually uh, it makes tons yeah. of sense yeah and tech power up saw it actually they put an mp700 pro in it and if anything they got a tiny boost on the random reads and writes everything else was bang on the same as if it was if it was on the the first uh, m.2 controller Probably because the 16x slot actually gets a certain set of priority lanes off the CPU. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mr. Malventano back in the day told me that he always tested NVMe drives using an adapter on the first PCIe ah, that's slot. That's right. I yep. remember him talking about that. So yeah. I went out and bought one to do that myself. And then, of course, the standard changed. And then I had to get a different one that was like, you know, 4.0 yeah. compliant. I didn't see anyone oh, ask, and but then I the do suspect standard you can't changed. boot off of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You cannot. Uh, you might be right. No, that makes I sense. I didn't see right. anyone ask. Sense, so. Just for additional storage. Is. Okay. But yeah, for people like Josh, who have been Me. worried about what they're going to do if they have to buy a B550 board, they have a sound card, they have you know expansion cards taking up space, but they want more M.2 slots than your standard B550 can provide. Well, get this graphics card, Josh. Get yeah, because I really want to upgrade to a 4060 Ti. Would it be an upgrade, though? No. Would you consider an upgrade to go from a 3080 to a 4060 Ti? <laughs> no. Bigger no. number, oh, better, Josh. Charge extra? Bigger number, better. Ti, better. Yeah. Okay. Who put this uh, webcam story in here? Is this something we we're going to talk about? Me. Okay. Yeah. Uh, some months ago, Orbeck, uh, people got a hold of me and, and started talking to me about their cameras and their interesting cameras because they're like infrared enhanced stereo units with also a secondary camera doing rgb so people who are doing you know a lot of ai stuff and and i hate to mention ai but i mean actual ai stuff like for us for instance we we use infrared cameras um to look at animals getting you know blown away by wind turbines um and it's a really handy thing and we use machine learning on that to be able to, you know, get an accurate count of, of animals in these wind turbine farms. And, and we do these massive statistics on it and whatnot, but we had to kind of make our own things ourselves. And so these were not stereoscopic. It was just three IR cameras, uh, around the entire, uh, um, unit, the wind turbine. And, uh, these people are actually starting to do stuff that, we could actually use these aren't weatherized which unfortunate for us because we have another big project coming up that we could use something like this but uh it's it's dual ir cameras uh so you get stereoscopic views of you know what you're doing so they're thinking hey you know let's do this internally 
we've got this camera, we've got this machine learning thing set up, and here's a warehouse. And it's got robots and other things going through there and people. And, you know, it can see pathways and it can, it can you know, because it's stereoscopic, it can figure out how far things are away. And so um, these are, I don't know what the prices on these things are yet. They're probably not real cheap, but it's an interesting technology. Oh, no, it's, yeah, but 420 bucks. That's not horrific. For what it um, is? No. Yeah, yeah. And so it's a really interesting technology. And I thought I'd, you know, kind of bring it up because you can actually do real honest to goodness work with this, with machine learning and, you know, being able to record things in 3D um, and still get, you know, an RGB. So it's, it's a three camera setup that is 20 bucks and it's a high resolution uh, IR, which is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, if, if you're a professional and you're actually working on these things, this is a really interesting product. And, and I'm going to see if I can't get something from them uh, to do some actual testing when field work starts again yeah. and see if it's actually useful for the testing that we do and uh, and the actual you know field uh, work that that my day job does to you know make money. So yeah, I thought it was a kind of cool uh, little thing, and and just as Gavin said, it looks like a Mini Connect, and it sh- yeah essentially is. Uh, it, it's very similar in in, in what the ways. old Connect could do. It might be cheaper to so, get yeah. than an old Connect camera nowadays too. Yeah, yeah, because people are still or using right. those for three D uh, mapping and such. Hmm. Hmm. Can you stream yourself in 3D with that, Josh? Probably. Um, you probably 3D. could. If there was a protocol yeah. for it. Thank it's stereoscopic, you. so yes. Yeah. We yeah. could offer that to people as like a perk, like Josh, a virtual visit with Josh in 3D. They can rotate the camera well, around. Well, 3D IR. <laughs> oh. Okay. So I'll be a little washed out, but, you know, well, it'll work. It depends on how We're interactive gonna... we can make this. We're oh, gonna sorry. Do some yeah, Bob shifting. Smith in the chat. Only fans only. Sorry. Oh, that's, of course, of course. That's Josh's separate gig. It's going right. to be frequency shifting, so we're going to shift that IR image down. Hmm. It'll be fine. Isn't this how spectrum. Face ID works on Apple iPhones? Is 3D infrared? In fact, it it completely does. Yes, because they map your face you with IR. Depths. Correct. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Fast. Fantastic. Which is why it works when you have glasses on, or well, it's why it works in the dark. Things that because you're using infrared it's why it works technology. In the dark. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Right. All right. Uh, <laughs> the Josh Hotcast. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> hmm. All right, we're going to take Sorry. a break from the Josh Hotcast. <clears throat> Let's move to our favorite segment, everybody's favorite segment. It is in mm-hmm. Security Corner. First story from Ars Technica Linux devices are under attack by a never before seen worm. It's uh, it, M- Mirai again, uh, is it not, uh, yeah. Jeremy? Yeah, it is. It is. So it's it's not that it's never before seen. It's a never before seen use and adaptation of Mirai, which was or Mirai, which was going nuts on the Internet of Things and turning everything into a Bitcoin miner. And well, guess what? That's what it's doing now. And so it's coming in and affecting infecting a scan or infecting a server through the the usual ways that uh, they get in, and then it goes out and it looks over Telnet because you know we got to ruin absolutely everything, and if it can, it will self replicate itself uh, over a couple of different vulnerabilities via Telnet. Well, that, that's the old way, Jeremy. The old way was was Telnet. I thought this new and improved Mirai bot would actually oh. also use SSH, our secure pal, SSH. Uh, yes, if you've got a weak password on your SSH or yes, exactly. some of the vulnerabilities we mentioned previously, this Remember. will be going. And Mirai used to be DDoS. They're not bothering to yes. do that. They're, they're mine and coin on your stuff now. And uh, the crypto miner is even sort of new as well. It's a, and I haven't run into this one, but it's XM rig, which is 
you know, a, a new type of crypto miner, which sort of makes it a little harder to track. And so Akamai has been seeing this thing for about a year now. Uh, it doesn't look particularly sophisticated, but it's novel. So people aren't really protecting against it. And uh, the, the, one of the nastier things apparently is that uh, the guys don't have a, a wallet address attached to it. It's sending it to some private something somewhere, which is unfortunately, obviously one of the easiest ways to track them down. So yeah, it's a bunch. It, it doesn't look like it's state sponsored. doesn't look like that sort of advanced. And it looks sort of like it's a bunch of people that have figured this out and are just pooling their own uh, coin until they can uh, drop it because uh, the SEC is allowing you to do that now, apparently. And they didn't get hacked. They actually did do that. So, yeah, it's it's kind of nasty. And really, it's just more a matter of going through uh, the tools that, on GitHub to check whether your SSH instances are vulnerable or not to try and block this thing. And secure your telnet in case you haven't, because it still happily does that as well. Yes, so does I, both. 2024. Mm-hmm. Not even Linux is immune. Hey, and a throwback to years past. Remember the excitement about IoT and the excitement about blockchain mm. and crypto? Well, combine those sure two do. things together to IoT tools that can be locked by nefarious actors demanding crypto. You know, it's it's kind of a the best of all worlds. Oh, it's worse than that. Network connected it make, wrenches. Yeah. It might make so, plain doors fly off. Yes. So you'd ask yourself who in their right mind would buy a Bosch net runner or sorry, nut runner uh, wrench that's network connected. Well, this isn't for your home garage. This is Jeremy, for nut runner. What's a yes, nut it's runner? The Bosch nut runner, because of course it's called the nut runner, and that's just one of them. But these are for uh, industrial assembly where you need to apply an exact amount of torque when you're uh, putting in a bolt. So that's why they're network connected, because it knows what it's connecting to and it will provide that exact amount of torque. Because otherwise, you're stripping the bolt and it's going to pop off, or you didn't connect it, and uh, the side of your airplane is going to fall off. Because what this thing can do is not just lock your machine down and make you pay Bitcoin. Apparently, they can adjust the tolerances of the wrench while still having the wrench report the actual expected torque. Oh. So you think you're putting it in at a certain amount of torque. You're actually putting it in at a significantly higher torque, so it strips itself. And as far as you can tell, nope, that's a pass. That. It did exactly what it wanted to. I don't know what the NEXO OS uh, firmware is, but apparently it's used a lot in industrial uh, applications. So this is more than just, yeah, your wrench is locked and you can't use it. It's, no, we're actually sabotaging your entire assembly line by under or over tightening a whole bunch of things. And in things where you've got nanometers worth of uh, tolerances, this can be a bad thing. And in case you're worried that this is just like one uh, vulnerability, no, there's well over a dozen of them starting at an 8.8 .8 and going down to a 5.3. So it's, it, it's, you know, they've thrown a monkey wrench in the whole assembly line more or less. I They're talking it. about pushing out a, a patch sometime before the end of January, but uh, I can't see industrial lines being very interested in taking their lines down for a while to patch firmware in the hopes that it works. And are you guaranteed you're going to get all of it? Or are you going to be telling me I'm going to have to do this again in a month? Just dust off case, the old Sears Roebuck torque wrench and try to dial it in as best you can and just, you know, <laughs> keep going. It's probably fine. I, I, so I yeah, guess that was just a proof, of, that's a proof of concept, right? It looked like it was actually a security researcher who did this, and it was a not an actual ransomware attack. They haven't attack. found any in okay. the wild, but okay. uh, please not refer yet. to my previous statements about uh, how uh, assembly lines work and how interested they are in uh, doing a scan of their firmware. <laughs> mm. Next up, ransomware victims targeted by fake hackback offers. 
What's a hackback offer? Oh, the sad state of affairs we have in You hack my back, I back your hack. <laughs> you know, it's the it's the same sad story over and over again. Your multi-billion dollar company has been attacked by a ransomware gang from someplace on the planet. Uh, typically, these, this was the Royal and Akira ransomware gang where they have infiltrated your network, perhaps using the weak passwords you've left on your open Telnet port or SSH, and they have uh, encrypted or exfilled, exfiltrated all of your data. Uh, and then they're promising uh, to release uh, said uh, corporate uh, secrets onto the worldwide internet if you don't pay their ransom. Dun, 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 rides in a white knight saying, oh my gosh, as if you haven't been victimized enough. Noticing you've been hacked by set, ra said ransomware gang, let me help you out. I can reverse this ransomware attack for you. I can decrypt your data. I can hack back the hackers, as it were, and get into their system and erase it from their system. And What's happening the here price is... Of all for the low, low price of some partial Bitcoin or some, you know, few hundred thousand dollars of easy cash that the billion dollar corporation might be happy to pay. But the point here is, is if these corporations haven't been victimized enough in the first place by the ransomware gang, these white hats that are promising to decrypt, prevent the, the, um, the exfil of the data or to or hack back the ransomware gangs are themselves scammers just trying to make a buck off of the victimized companies. And this is the state of affairs that uh, ransomware and, uh, and malware has gotten us to, that even white hats riding in to save the day are suspect. So if anybody offers to help you out, make sure that you vet them well. That's the story on this one. I miss the old days where, I would, you know, hackers just meant somebody who hacked a mainframe to play a game at MIT. <laughs> Shell... Shall we play a game? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, way, speaking of games, topical. great transition. Topical. Yes. yes. Great transition. It's gaming quick hits already. Can you believe it? Archelund lets you explore like Elder Scrolls, but you fight top down. Oh, interesting. No first person combat. No, no demo. No slashy, slashy. It's in early access. You can get it for less than yeah. 30 bucks. How do you pronounce this? I haven't. I mean, Archeland, I'm assuming, okay. but it might be Archeland. This is weird. Archeland. Usually you explore third person and have first person combat. This is first person exploration. Yeah. Well, third person combat. Right? So the combat is sort of more like Final Fantasy Tactics or uh, okay. you know, any okay. other of those sort of games. Yeah. And what you do, but the walking around and it's not, you know, it, it, calling it looking like Morrowind, I think is fair. The There's a little intro nice. uh, video. Yeah. It looks nice. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Like it doesn't game. look absolutely gorgeous, but it does look nice and you're definitely walking around. But the second that you get into combat. Okay. Oh, yeah. So technical RPG. An RPG style. Yes. This is, uh, this is very interesting. Yeah. No, I'm very interested. I'm, 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 torn us so see what i mean like it's not utterly gorgeous but it's very nice looking mm -hmm. and you've got a whole story behind it apparently but and you know the usual sort of levers and clues and stuff but they will quickly i believe run into a little monster and combat begins okay so it's turn-based and you're on a grid yeah, oh, so interesting. A certain range, a bunch of powers, range and weapons. Such. Okay, okay. Yeah, this is good. Yeah, I'm close to the end of Baldur's Gate three, so I'm tempted to put it on pause and give this a shot because, I mean, the early access only gives you a couple of levels, but if you uh, remember the old uh, Warhammer RPG, the pen and paper one. Right, you didn't start out as a wizard. You started out as some loser apprentice or a, a rat hunter. And you had to work your way up levels until you actually sort of became a barbarian or a wizard or a knight. And so they're going with that as well. So it, it could be interesting. It, it sort of looks like it. I, I may just you know go ahead and grab it and give it a shot. 
because this is definitely right up my alley. 60 talents and abilities and 50 spells, 14 skills, 15 different careers, five playable races up to and including minotaurs and goblins, which you don't see very often. Uh, this could be rather interesting. Uh, it's four dimension games, which I didn't recognize, so I looked them up. They did something called Exiled Kingdoms back in huh. late uh, 90s, which looked a lot like uh, Fallout and played a lot like Fallout, and it's apparently in the same world as this. So they've stuck with it. Oh. So it'll be interesting to see how well they can pull it off. Will 16 gigabytes of VRAM improve those textures? Just <laughs> the curious might. want to know. There's, if there's a texture okay. patch, yeah, maybe. Well, yeah, let me uh, yeah. call it and I'll tell you. Gavin Thomas in the chat says, it looks like Star Wars chess. And it's funny because hey, it's like, hey, wait a minute. Strategy game, grid, grid battles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, chess. Okay. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Let the Wookiee win. Yes. <laughs> Next, uh, the Vectrex reborn, new life to a dead console. Tell me. I more. was just talking to Jeremy, Jeremy about this. I'm like, oh, I wanted one of these so bad when they came out. A crush of Lucifer, back in '82. Huh. Yeah. It was old. all vector. No pixels here, man. All vector. Fast. It's like a it's medical fast. imaging monitor or something that could do vector graphics, right? Yeah. It just came out at the very wrong time. Yes. Because right it was like, the, like uh, if video you look game at the picture, yes. Crashed. It's a portrait style, uh, what was it, eight inch uh, screen. Like and the entire thing is self contained. You just shove that little uh, cartridge in the side there, and away you go. They used to have these color uh, panels that you would put on, like mm-hmm. a like a, an overlay that you'd put on to color portions of the screen because it was only black and white. Yeah. Oh, that was like uh, the uh, Magnavox. I'm trying to remember. Uh, That's yes. it. Thank you, Josh. I was trying yes, to remember Josh. what that was. Exactly. I can't remember. Yeah. It started with an O. Omni something. Um, um, now my no, brain's totally failing me on it apart from remembering actually playing yeah. one of them on and going, oh my God, that's amazing. But it's a lot dimmer <laughs> now, isn't it? Yeah. Asteroids was a classic vector game. So what's uh, what's this about being reborn? That was what I was uh, You've got Odyssey. a group of people. Magnavox uh, Odyssey. Thank you, Michael. That's yes. it. Oh, Josh, yes. you're brilliant. Uh, not me, First Michael. Okay. Michael Boise. Uh, well, there he goes. So the thing is that uh, a, a bunch of people have sort of gotten together and there's now a site called Vectrex Multi where you can order box copies of some of the old cartridges to run. And there's people sort of looking at being able to redo them so that they can actually make new cartridges for people that have this. Uh, there's a few, they found a bunch of unreleased games that they're trying to finish, like uh, a proto oh, Star wow. Fox. Whoa. Imagine Star Fox, but purely Vector. Uh, and so they're, they're sort of trying to get this up and going. It, it should be interesting if uh, it does come out again. Truly, truly retro console gaming. Yes. <laughs> Very retro. Oh, Star Castle, another great vector game. Tempest. Does anybody remember Tempest? Yeah. Yeah. Tempest was a I great used to play Atari game. Tempest all the time. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. It was fantastic. It was hyper. Hyper. Yep. So you have to have a Vectrex that works. You do. This is a level or, of retro hipster I can never aspire to. Is uh, new game cartridges yes. for your Vectrex <laughs> from nineteen eighty two? Give it a year, right? Next thing we know, so, there's three of them behind Sebastian. Yeah, no yeah. This is another no, whole no, no, level. No, no. I, yep. I, I've washed my hands of retro console collecting. That was a dark part of my life that I don't want to revisit. You need, you need a Commodore CD thirty two. Commodore C thirty two Amiga motherboard, but yeah, it's, <laughs> I have like two totes full of uh, vintage consoles still that are like sorted by type, and I have them up on their sides, and it's like this is you don't want to live like that. Don't don't do that. Okay. <laughs> Plus, Vectrex has to take up a lot I mean, more space than Genesis and SNES yep. consoles. Moving on. 
All right, move on to the review portion of this week's podcast. And Corsair had some new stuff to show at CES, and they actually sent us in advance their exciting new K55 Core. It is inexpensive as heck. Previously, I think their cheapest keyboard was like $50 or $60. This is launching at $39.99. So it's rubber dome. Just like the previous uh, K55 stuff that we looked at, Brett had the last review of one of these. And yep, I remember it. Not a bad keyboard. No, exactly. And I was, I was, I was looking at your conclusion, Brett, and I was evaluating the thing. And like, you know what? Honestly, I think Brett got it right. So I just stole the end of your <laughs> review and just pasted it into mine, giving you credit, of course. <laughs> Because I oh, couldn't put things any better than our own Brett V, who ended his look at the K55 Pro XT like this. Quote, if mechanical key switches are a bit too noisy for your tastes, yet you still want a gaming keyboard with high-quality programmable RGB, credible 12-key rollover protection, audio transport controls, and some macro programmability, then at, you know, price, in this case $40, yes. you should consider mm-hmm. this keyboard. And I absolutely agree. Plus, still there's true. kind of some interesting elements to this like this is a very basic they, keyboard all plastic but look at what the have bottom they done? here what have there they are done these little like in the meantime lights oh. that shine down to so get just That's a new. little bit of a glow on your desk under the key it's very subtle just a little extra there and look of course iq you can customize your lighting there's uh 10 lighting zones you're not individually backlit <clears> keys you're <throat> not key switches it's a membrane system you do have these dedicated buttons in the upper right-hand corner for adjusting your volume. You have a button for uh, brightness control of the lighting, or you can just turn it off with this button as well. If you don't want to use IQ and you don't want lighting, you know, you can do whatever you want. But it felt okay. This is It had uh, light uh, key presses. It doesn't have a lot of travel, so you can actually type pretty fast on this thing. I didn't have any kind of accuracy issues with it like I have with some keyboard just because I'm, you know, I'm not very good at typing so overall not bad and i just feel like the whole thing goes right back to that price if this was 60 or 70 dollars eh, i don't know nope. about that but 39.99 they know what they're doing it's a good price it's a wired keyboard it's basic but it's not loud so if you need quiet even this um this cherry mx keyboard i use for streaming is called the stream the cherry stream desktop keyboard this uses scissor switches so there is a there's a sound to them so membranes they have their place in society i'm just rambling at this point uh so that's my quick review let's move on to picks of the week and josh you have an exciting one for us. So yeah, this is uh, uh, I don't know how long this has been originally out, but I haven't really seen much of it. Uh, it's the the MSI Meg X570 Unify, and it's got up to USB 3.1 Gen 2, but not by two, and it features a you know two and a half gigabit Ethernet. I mean, it's it's you know under 250 bucks. It's uh, in fact forty bucks off uh, the regular price. So two ten will get you a brand new X five seventy AM four motherboard that uh, does not have RGB throughout. Uh, it looks fairly solid. It's got good expansion capabilities. Um, three M dot two and and uh, you know three full you know well one's a sixteen and the other two are by eight and probably that bottom one's by four. Um, I know the third slot disables if you install the third M.2. Um, but yeah, it's got plenty of juice. Decent What's network. What's the 460s for? Yeah. Something like that. Active cooling on the yeah. chipset. Oh, that, that, yep. Yeah. It's got it all. It's just, yeah. It's not three, you know, Gen 2 by 2, but it's just Gen 2. So it's 10 gigabit USB 3.1. That's so. fine. It's still plenty of juice and uh, a reasonable price. And yeah, you can get a 5700X3D or a 5800X3D or go to Micro Center, 5600X3D. 
they're all excellent little processors for, and, the, and none of them have Microsoft Pluton. So it's <laughs> not the positive. Yeah. There are people one who of, really don't want that technology. Yeah. Yeah. And I can understand that. I don't particularly want it. <clears throat> and I'm not really a tinfoil hat kind of guy, but it's, it's not. Yeah. No, anyway, it can be abused. It's unnecessary but, yeah. at the best. Yeah. Like most advancements in modern computer technology. Yeah. For being honest, Jeremy, your pick. Yeah, so I've been uh, working on a review, and I'm currently waiting on an active subwoofer to arrive so that I can continue it. But uh, I just figured that, you know, since we don't really do much video review and might not have much chance when we're actually on it because they might both be wired up. Uh, I was impressed because you, you've probably noticed that Fozzie sends me stuff every once in a while. And usually it comes in a box about this size. The box that arrived is this size. Oh, I see Canada Post had their way with it. Uh, yeah, this one uh, <laughs> did get a little bit of love. <laughs> so it's a bigger unit, it looks like, here. So what usually comes as about the size of a paperback is now almost oh. the size of a hardcover. And it has speed holes on the side because Ooh. they've increased their uh, cooling. Uh, like they did with the, the V3, which is the last one I took a look at. And so they've done some interesting things with this. Those are balanced XLR inputs on the back. So you can hook this in to a professional system as opposed to an RCA. They've also included an active subwoofer, hence why I'm waiting for an active subwoofer. And the other thing that people were asking about is, why is it always just a stereo? Why can't we have a monoblock? So uh, this is specifically for mono mode, which you can switch to on the front if this camera will focus a little oh, okay. bit. Yeah. So yeah, you can toggle between mono and stereo or XLR and RCA in. And that means they sent me two of them. Ah. I currently only have the one wired in because I want to try that with an active subwoofer before I hook them both in and have two mono blocks and one active subwoofer. I'm not going to go crazy and try and go with two active subwoofers on that, but that's, it's interesting. This is unfortunately uh, on pre-order until the end of the month. Uh, they put 2000 of each model out. One that comes with uh, the heat or sorry, with the, power supply that we've seen on the others and the one that this one came with, which is a significantly higher power rating. So okay. that you can get even more juice out of these things. So I see they have more, they have a 48 volt mm -hmm. five amp power supply. Yes, they do. 32 volt. Okay. So, so they've always shipped 32 volts out um, with the suggestion that it is compatible with 48 volt, but a couple of people, including myself said, so why don't you just charge an extra 20 bucks and throw that in there? Yeah. So in mono mode at 48 volts, it's supposed to be able to do 235 watts at four ohms, which is very strong. Yes. So I don't know if that's like limited duration, if it's across the entire frequency of course, spectrum. But or, it, you know, it is more or less across the entire frequency spectrum, but it, it's peaks. It's not. Oh, okay. I don't think it's sustained anyways. I certainly haven't tried because uh, I'm glad that it's a uh, type A pot with uh, the curve on it as opposed to the straight line because it gets pretty loud as it is with absolutely no distortion or anything. It's it's interesting and it shows it fun. I, I mean, I don't want to go into the whole review because I'm going to write it, but uh, as opposed to just offering you two replaceable op amps for your left and right, they went with five. So there's a, there's a lot to play with here. Yeah. Looks I see that they're replaceable if you burn them as well. Or uh, there's an entire list of ones that they suggest you could replace them with if it doesn't sound exactly like you want to. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of a pain to take apart. You do have to get the uh, banana wire bear speakers off of the back to be able to slide the entire thing out. And one of the other features it has, which is a 12-volt uh, trigger, may actually disconnect because they don't seem to have put any slack on that whatsoever. But uh, honestly, that's just so that you can fire up your stereo at the same time you fire up the Fozzie. And honestly, in my experience, uh, the 12 volt uh, 
trigger doesn't necessarily always work the way you want it to, but we shall see. Yes. All right. Excellent. Uh, Brett, your pick. Uh, one of my favorite things to, to select from during this uh, segment is networking. So I went back to Ubiquity, one of my uh, favorite networking, uh, networking gear manufacturers, purveyors of fine networking. And um, they have a very funnily named switch. Funnily, is that even a word? It's an interestingly named switch. They call it the USW aggregation switch. Don't let the name fool you. It is simply a eight port. 10 gigabit SFP plus switch with all of the abilities of a, a layer two switch that you can imagine you would want to be able to do, but it's eight ports and the price isn't that bad from a manufacturer of like ubiquity that's adoptable by any of their controllers. $269 will get you an eight port, um, hundred and I believe it's 160, um, uh, gigabits of switching simultaneously. It's either 80 or 160. I'd have to go back and look, but it's it's very impressive for the amount of load that it will handle. They sort of position this in their lineup as to be what they call an aggregation switch, meaning that it's meant to drive traffic into other switches, but it is a perfectly serviceable 10 gigabit switch mm-hmm. on its own. So if you're looking for a very high quality 10 gigabit switch for not a tremendous amount of money. $270 is somewhat reasonable. That isn't from the likes of uh, uh, Moker, which is, you, you know, you can spend, yeah, you can spend a little bit less. You could probably about half that, uh, about maybe 120 or so for um, off, off, off brand switches that aren't adoptable by your Ubiquity Cloud Key or Ubiquity USG or whatever for controlling purposes. This is more in line with people who are looking to kind of, um, homogenize their network environment uh, and make it uh, easily controllable from one place. So good deal if you're ubiquity house. Yeah. And aggregation switches are really good at traffic management. Very, very good. I I have a pick. I will pick something. Okay. So I've mentioned this before and I don't know if I actually made it an official pick or not, but Okay. Here's the scenario. You're, we talked about the Vectrex thing earlier. There are people out there who you know, they have the time and the disposable income to dabble with old, constantly broken technology, or maybe they're really good at soldering or just hate themselves. But if you're interested in old computers and you want to put software on them, and you know, there's all these different ways to do it. And a lot of people go resort to flashcards and SD cards and things in place of hard drives. But there is this really interesting product that not only can give you an interface to create floppy disks for old systems very easily for modern systems and very cheaply, I might add, but it also is a flux reader as well. And if you've ever looked into how much it would cost to get yourself an interface like the Cryoflux, we're talking like a hundred plus dollars plus the cost of a working vintage floppy drive. These things called Grease Weasel, even though I see listings for you know them being used as a Mister attachment or for Amigas, they work for just about anything. And the one I ended up buying from some place in Ireland that I've forgotten the name of right now. Here's one from Amiga Kit for about twenty five dollars. You can use any floppy drive with this. So I grabbed a Sony floppy drive from the 2000s out of an old Optiplex, attached it to this, powered it up. It just runs off of USB 2.0 power, actually. You choose in the free software uh, what you're writing to. You can say, I'm writing to Amiga, I'm writing to you know Apple, I'm writing to IBM, whatever, and it writes at a very low level. It can write the format right along with the data. So it's just, it's pretty exciting if you're into retro computers that you can finally basically get yourself a cryoflux for like, you know, $25, $30 from some seller on eBay or Etsy or from a website. So that's my pick is uh, making floppy disks for old computers is what I'm using it for. But you can also archive stuff so you can, Get yourself an old Amiga or IBM floppy that's, you know, rare, hard to find. Like this, uh, the PAL booter 
floppy <laughs> that I, you know, just, you want to play PAL games on your NTSC Amiga? Well, I can archive this disc and I can share it with the world with oh, my okay. grease weasel. Honestly, I is that, is that how they found that DOS 0.86 or whatever? Well, I bet you it was. They probably archived it with one. Yeah, it's, it's the yeah. go-to yeah. archival thing for floppies now there's like tech tangents had a pretty extensive video on it pretty recently about how to use it and it's just kind of crazy guys i i will connect this thing to my windows 10 computer you know 2000s era floppy drive from a pc put in a floppy disk and i can it will write one track at a time until it has made me an Amiga disc. It's crazy. And I bring it down here and I can put yeah, it into Amiga. That, is, that is crazy. Play a game. In that minutes. is a bit crazy. Because the Amiga disc actually, actually used physical spaces on the media that yes. traditional yes. floppies didn't track no. well to. So mm. I imagine that a Sony probably does well. But yeah, maybe it's some a of good drive. Even if it is not a vintage drive, but yeah. Yes, Amigas were like 880K, where on the PC yeah. side of things, they were only getting like 720, yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. So they, they tracked in and they tracked out a little bit physically further than mm-hmm. a lot of the mm-hmm. typical mechanisms did. So not all of them will work. Funnily enough, so. also where they tended to fail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, weird. <laughs> yeah. Mm. So yeah, I can I can archive this uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, Amiga game disc now, and you know, probably not share it with the world because it's probably copyrighted somehow. Yeah, Maybe probably, not. probably. Okay, I think that'll do it for our show this week. Uh, we want to thank you for watching, listening, subscribing, hitting that notifications bell to find out when we go live for events like this podcast recording session that you may or may not have been watching along with us. For those moments you never get in the final version of the podcast, like when I thought I hit mute and then <laughs> obnoxiously blew my nose directly into my microphone. And when I Correct. blew my nose, you did. it's yep. uh, it's especially obnoxious. It sounds like a, a honking kind of... I, have a, I, I thought Dizzy a, Gillespie, you know, came back from the grave. <laughs> okay, when you break your nose <laughs> it was in a kid, and it never event. gets properly reset, when I blow my mm, nose, right. it, like, yeah. it makes this does, does, sound... So. Does deviated septum mean anything to you? Does yes. Ring a- yes. It means something okay. to me. Right. And it's why I right, snore yeah. so much yep. that my wife can't ah, okay. stand that it. Explains hmm. it. Yes. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, where were we? Uh, thank you so much. Talking and all about that Rick stuff. James, I think. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, does anybody else have any words uh, for the, the audience? Mm. Do we have any no. unanswered questions back Josh, there? Josh, can you... Uh, Goes an outro? No, no. I don't, why would anybody want an outro from me? The last thing that they want to do is listen to my nasally voice, talk to them to sleep as they're trying to go to bed because they've been listening to a boring ass podcast for the last two hours. <laughs> <laughs>